Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to this uh, session on unlocking Heart of Aid Industries net zero transformation. Uh, we appreciate you all taking the time to join us today in this uh, panel organized, co-organized by Arco Horizons and uh, the International Energy Agency. My name is Marianne Stixet. I'm Head of Communications and External Affairs at uh, Arco Horizons, and I'm pleased to be joined by a series of, of um, leaders from both the public sector and the private sector to have this engaging discussion about how we can, uh, how we can, um, um, what solutions are needed in order to uh, to bring down uh, greenhouse gas emissions from some of these, from some of these industries. Um, I will. We will start off by uh, a few introductory remarks by the uh, IEA, and so I will bring, the, leave the floor to Peter Levy. He will also be um, your moderator for the rest of this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. As Marianne said, I'm, I'm Peter Levi. I work for the International Energy Agency. Um, and I'm first to begin with an apology for uh, Dr. Birol's absence. He sends his apologies. Uh, there was a change in his uh, binding commitments this afternoon. I, I apologize as well. I apologize because you're stuck with me. But the good news is that uh, we'll have more time for discussion. We'll have uh, more time to get through the questions that we want to discuss. Um, I'll give a very short introduction to why we're having this discussion, I think. While we're seeing uh, some important signs of progress in specific areas of the energy system, we're seeing rapid solar PV and wind deployment in nearly all regions of the world. We're seeing huge increases in the, in the sales of electric vehicles and the batteries that are used to produce them. Um, we're, sh we're seeing actually an uptick in clean energy sector investment in 2021. These are all good signs. But the progress that we're seeing today is not universal to all sectors. The hard to evade sectors that we're here to discuss and how we can unlock the emissions from those sectors um, are really, uh, you know, sectors where we don't have the technologies commercially available in the market today, or at least that's one of the key attributes that the IEA would ascribe to these sectors that, that designates them as a hard to abate sector. However, there are many other attributes that are, make them challenging, and I want to hear from our panelists on, on that question uh, first and foremost. Um, just briefly to say what the IEA sees are, as these hard to abate sectors. We're talking about heavy industries, so steel, cement, and chemicals. And then we're also talking about long distance transport modes. So aviation, shipping, um, and also long distance trucking. That's what we see them as. This is an open discussion. We want to hear from the panelists, the real experts. Um, and so I'm gonna bring them up now, and we're gonna split the panel into two, uh, two sessions. So we're going to start with uh, bringing up the first panel. I think the panelists know who they are, but I will introduce them as they come to the stage. <laughs> uh, we're joined by Henrietta uh, Tiggerson, um, for, who's the CEO of uh, Fleet and Strategic Brands at uh, AP Mola Maersk. Uh, we're joined by Lei Zheng, um, who's the CEO of Envision Energy. We're joined by Irina Gorbanova uh, from ArcelorMittal, who heads up the XCarb Innovation Fund. Uh, and we're joined by Gokcha Mehta of uh, um, South Pole. Um, we're delighted to have our panelists, and we're also joined by our co-organizers, uh, represented by Fritjof uh, from Aka Horizons, as a, as a bonus member <laughs> to, our, to our rather large panel. Um, and I, I would like to start by asking you, and please do come in where you would like, but I will go in order because we're going to be resource efficient with this microphone and, and share it. Um, so indicate to me when you'd like the microphone. But we're going to start with this question about what makes these industries uh, hard to abate, specifically with respect to the sector that you are uh, working in or supporting through your, through your work. So we're going to start with Henrietta. So I'm going to pass on the microphone. Thank you very much. And thank you. Nice to meet all my fellow uh, panel participants here. So for shipping, hard to abate is clearly uh, there's an issue with the actual propulsion. Um, the engine technology, we believe we have solutions for that. The key challenge we're facing is indeed to have sufficient fuels. And the price differential that we see between traditional fossil fuels and these new greener fuels. But both price and volume, huge challenge. Um, we want green methanol for our vessels we have put on order. I think there's only around 30,000 tons produced today of green methanol. Our vessels alone use more than 10 million tons a year. So we need quite a whole lot more of production to come online. 
great way to start us up there and over to Irina. Um, yes, uh, likewise, thank you um, everyone. Uh, great to be here and such an important subject to discuss. Uh, what I realized is that sometimes it's good to give the context. I was actually doing some number cracking with the preacher of, uh, earlier this week, and I appreciated that not maybe everyone appreciates the key numbers around steel industry. So I'll ask you guys, how much steel you, you think is produced annually, globally? <laughs> well, you might know. Anyone? How much? Excellent. So two billion, you get an A, A plus. <laughs> so well, um, to be pre not precise, but the, the numbers are, it's 1.9 billion last year has been produced, so very close to two billion. And this number is set to grow to an, esti to an estimated 2.5 by around 2050 or so. Um, now the second question, and how much CO2 you think is emitted per ton of steel produced currently? You know, it's all the answers. <laughs> okay, you get the second A. Close to two tons of CO2 is emitted for every ton of steel produced through the blast furnace pathway. You can do the math. It's four gigaton of CO2 emissions that steel industry accounts for, which is roughly 8%, so just below 10% of global CO2 emissions. So I kind of given you the context so you can appreciate the challenge that we are facing because um, Peter, you ask, you know, what's, you know, why is it hard to obey? The industry is now one of the largest emitters, but I see it as a fantastic opportunity for us to make an impact and to decarbonize the steel making. So we as a group made the pledge to become carbon neutral by 2050 to get to net, net zero. And it's a very ambitious target because it's a very capital intensive industry. And the whole world is now operating with those assets. I'm trying to compete with the guys there. I'm not sure I'm succeeding. <laughs> um, let me know, if, wave if you don't hear me. OK, great, so you can hear me. Um, so, so that's the reason it's hard to obey. But I'm quite optimistic that with the right efforts, with the right investment, with the right technologies, we'll get there. So we, as a group, like I said, decided to become carbon neutral by 2050, we have a very comprehensive roadmap of how we're going to get there. So there are a number of technology pathways. It's not going to be easy. Um, it's not going to be, you know, a walk in the park, but I do believe we can do it. I can talk about it more, but maybe I should give a word to my fellow panelists, otherwise I'll take the rest of the time. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. I don't know if cement sector is represented here, um, not. Okay, because I, so at a South Pole, um, I work with both steel and cement industry and also shipping. Um, so what makes uh, steel uh, hard to bet, there are many questions, many, many reasons, but one component, at least in my role, I, I, I try to address what is uh, the, the fuel. So the fuel and also, of course, the, the feedstock. So it, what makes it hard to bet is the, currently for at least one set of technology for direct reduction, is the not uh, the unavailability of hydrogen so in one of my uh, one of my projects that i'm i'm trying to address that uh, hydrogen uh, bottleneck uh, for uh, steel projects and the other one is cement uh, so since cement is not represented let's uh, just briefly look at what makes a cement sector hard to abate that is also of course fuel that we can go about uh, many things like there's the fuel there's efficiency material efficiency clean care factor there are many things that need to be addressed but to get to net zero, we still currently need either a replacement for limestone or CCS. Um, so CCS uh, is, is a challenging uh, factor uh, because we don't know what to do with the CO2 uh, because it doesn't have a value. But you can uh, actually mineralize and uh, lock uh, this CO2 in, in, in concrete. So CO2 mineralization is one pathway uh, to reach there. And at South Pole, uh, we actually work currently uh, on CO2 mineralization, uh, and we are developing a methodology uh, to, put a, uh, to put a carbon value uh, to help monetize the avoided carbon, because this is removal. And we also launched uh, what is called a next-gen facility. We launched the double. So the next-gen next gen facility is a, a facility that brings together buyers 
uh, we have uh, UBS, we have um, a yeah, number of large buyers, like five large buyers of carbon markets who will buy removals at, at a price $200 per ton of carbon, so per credit, $200. And we are also buying, we are also buying this carbon credits from cement mineralization projects. But first we need the methodology. So cement and concrete, and now we actually have someone from cement and concrete in the room. You can also catch him later, uh, the high level champion for, uh, for concrete just in time. But I'll hand over to you. Thank you. So Envision probably is a bit different. So we, do, we are not in the hard to obey sector. We make our net zero commitment, including scope three by 2028. So that's our commitment. And uh, we actually producing all kind of leading green technologies, including hydrogen electrolyzer and uh, also wind turbines, batteries, digital solutions, also about synthetic biology. So we are here to help to be the net zero decarbonization partner. For instance, so when I talk to people from Muskie, so we had a solution. Because I'm asking why not using green ammonia? And, uh, and she, she said, okay, because e-methanol is more available to have an immediate impact. Ammonia combustion engine takes time. Actually, two things. Envision now is able to deliver green ammonia at the cost of eight hundred dollar price, cost level, price level the five hundred, co cost is the five hundred. So it's cheaper than green ammonia, using our advanced electrolyzers and renewables, and we are also investing this ammonia turbines. So ammonia turbine also ammonia combustion engine. So this part, I believe, before two thousand twenty five, they are going to be commercial available ammonia turbine for up to 30 megawatt level to actually burning ammonia to generate electricity. Also, the in internal combustion engine will be ready as well. And if, for instance, for green steel, and we develop a net zero industrial park. We're producing hydrogen. At the same time, we can have our customer producing green steel e in the same industrial park, which is uh, very meaningful. You don't need to transport hydrogen. You don't need a storage hydrogen. Actually, green hydrogen to green steel in a total system using 100% renewable energy. Now we build a natural industrial park already in Inner Mongolia. We produce green batteries, 100% natural batteries already for 10 gigawatt hour. So this is the ecosystem using the independent renewable energy system. We can fully utilize the lowest cost renewable energy. And for you, cement. So we are investing in company like uh, synthetic biology. So just imagine the coral reef is solid. It's taking CO2 from the air. Then become the material similar to construction. So lots of uh, micro living things. They are by the DNA editing. They can be the, this material source to even to come, come across concrete. So that's actually one area is very critical I'd like to mention today is the synthetic biology. Now, the, the, the use for fossil fuel is, is a fine for energy purpose, but we still need lots of fossil fuel for what? For chemical process, because all our material here, this is all make, making from petrochemicals. So when the oil is not being used, how can you do these materials? So that's the synthetic biology. We eventually, we need lots of CO2, we need a lot of carbon, but the carbon is not from oil. It's carbon from the air and the fixed by plant or by eggies. So they, they are using synthetic biology. You can create, for instance, synthetic bio nylon. Today, one company we invest in, they are making a one million ton bio nylon a day to re replace chemical nylon. So that's a, a field we have to really address. So this is the area need to really huge investment to, to actually to, you know, to prevent in case the petrochemical industrial collapse, where, where is the material we can kind of working for us for tomorrow? Thank you. Thank you. Um, your question was the
problems or the challenge we're facing, uh, you all answered to that, so, but I'm just repeating the question now. That, so the, the, the challenges we face in our hard to abate uh, industrial sectors. And I think I just want to turn it around and say that I think it's solving these problems that it's partly our business idea. And I listen to my colleagues here. I think that's what basically gets them up in the morning as well. So, but I just want to say a couple of words about Aqua Horizons because we, we, you know, hard to abate is some as a challenge that we actually see as a business opportunity. So if we like, if you say, uh, wicked problems. That's easier said than done, I have to admit though. So, but we are investing and developing projects both on the renewable side, producing energy. We have CCS, which is integrated in many parts of the hard to abate sectors. Uh, and also of, we work with hydrogen which all, again, of course, has been mentioned here by many, uh, is, is very important in hard bed sectors. But we also use that when we go into industry, industrial sectors such as uh, iron and, and steel. We are also involved in cement production through our CCS uh, engagements and so on. So addressing sort of the wicked problems in hard bed sectors, we think is extremely important. Obviously it's important because of the CO2 emissions, but it's also important because it provides us, it, it, it pushes solutions that we also need in other sectors. We need hydrogen and ammonia in other sectors, the optics, uh, we have heard examples of that, of course. We need CCS across the board and so on. So I think, so, so looking at how everything sort of maybe meets in the hard to abate sectors and trying to address that, I think is, is very important. And that's something that we're working on, which is also why it's very important to, to see energy and industry together. So while we've had sort of established value chains with the energy industry delivering to the industry, uh, so to the manufacturing industries and, and so on, I think now we have to think that this value change cannot be just fixed by just turning a few screws here and there and cleaning a little bit up. We have to break them down and build new value chains across. And that's really, really important. And we're gonna talk about collaboration afterwards, but I think, you know, how do we deal with it? How do we work together as an industry? Uh, in order to solve this. And, and as I said already, we, we sort of have stakes in different parts of that picture in that we're working with the energy supply side as well as the industrial side. Uh, so, but challenges, of course, big challenges, and we need to also have risk uh, uh, instruments that give th makes this profitable so that our products are sold. Of course, we all need that. Uh, but also, Many of these solutions will, of course, require that there are su governmental support schemes uh, supporting the introduction of these new technologies. Thank you very much, Fritjof, and thank you to all the other panelists. I'm going to give the microphone straight back to all of you and ask you to comment on two uh, elements. You've, you've identified some of the challenges, some of the problems. Um, you've also already identified a couple of the solutions, whether it's CCUS, hydrogen, methanol, ammonia. Um, but I'd like you to talk about those solutions that you see are as most important. Um, and I'd also like to say, like hear about what the steps you are taking to, to get to those solutions. And this can be in the, you know, the supporting indirect role for these industries, or it could be in your, your sectors, um, you know, your, your individual sectors. Um, can I start with you again, Henrietta? You get the, the raw deal by not having time from the, all the others. I'll try to make it uh, specific. I would say for, uh, shipping is inherently global. So a key thing for shipping is actually also that the regulation that we see, uh, regulation through the IMO, that it will create an even playing field within shipping. Because one thing is what different jurisdictions uh, could do, and we, but we really need a global measure. So I think that is a key element. Then we are working within our value chains. We would also very much like to see the traditional energy companies come uh, much more forward, but I would say regulation, and then I also think the customers. We need to have dialogue with customers in terms of being willing to pay a premium. Um, you know, it's actually great because everyone's talking about challenges. It's good to speak about solutions for a change. Um, I think technologically, we at least identified the pathways how we're going to get to the low carbon or zero carbon steel making. One is what everyone's discussing is DRI based on green hydrogen. And we made already a number of announcements across Europe. We announced um, DRI, uh, DRI module to be built based on green hydrogen in Spain in France, in Belgium, in Germany, and also Canada. 
and I'm actually pleased to share with you that very recently, a couple of weeks ago, we broke ground on the first project in Canada that will produce two point, close to 2.5 million tons of um, green steel. Well, initially it will be based on natural gas, but then uh, ultimately on green hydrogen, because maybe that's, you know, speaking of the challenges, is some of our assets can be green hydrogen ready, but then it's really around the green hydrogen infrastructure availability. You, you need to have the supply of green hydrogen, and it's a very capital, uh, very energy intensive industry. So, um, but we can't still, we can't sit and wait until green hydrogen infrastructure is available. So we're also trialing uh, what we call smart carbon route. And again, it's also to the point you were making, I also really believe in circularity. So for instance, one example of what we are doing in Belgium, we take wood waste and through the refection we produce bio coal, which we then replace, uh, we replace the, fo uh, the, the coking coal with the bio coal in the blast furnace and the resultant gases from the blast furnace we capture and using biofermentation technology we produce bioethanol and I think it's a very cool process and it would even be um, even better example if you were to start with the plastic waste because you know you start with the plastic waste and then you produce bioethanol so that gives you uh, the perfect circularity example so I'm um, you know speaking of solutions it's not just one I think we need to uh, proceed with a number of things. I know also direct electrolysis of iron ore, although it's still in a very nascent stages, but shows a lot of potential. So we are also working on a number of technologies that can result in that. What I do, I lead our innovation fund. And the reason we launched the innovation fund is in addition to those identified pathways, we need to support some of the emerging and potentially game-changing technologies to accelerate our journey. So since the launch of the fund, we made a number of investments. We invested across the value chain of steel making. So we invested in a concentrated solar power business. We invested in a very promising hydrogen technology. It's a, it's a novel startup um, that's going to produce hydrogen without membranes. So hopefully it will get uh, the production costs much below the levels it is now. We also invested in biofermentation technology company called Lanzatech. We made an investment. The recent investment was in nuclear. We actually, we think that nuclear has to be part of the renewable energy mix. And then of course, finally, the issue around renewable energy, it's an intermittent nature. And that's the reason we are supporting and we made an investment in the long duration energy storage solution so that you know, ultimately we need the, the storage to make sure that we have this constant supply of renewable energy. So I'm just, you know, we're speaking about solutions. I'm very much the person who wants to roll up the sleeves and start doing things. So I think it's great to see so much IQ and brain now going into some of those technologies. So that, that gives me hope and, uh, and you know, that we're actually going to get there. Um, yeah, and it's great uh, just to build on, on what you said, I think, First of all, yes, there's a still scarcity of hydrogen. So at Southwall, we are an environmental services company. One of those things we do is we buy, trade, sell carbon, uh, carbon credits in voluntary carbon markets. Uh, but we also develop methodologies and um, create the enabling environment for, for some of these projects that don't receive uh, a support from innovation funds. So when we look at Europe, when, when we look at Europe, we see most of the steel, today's green steel projects they receive funding or subsidy, um, and in particular from the innovation fund. What's innovation fund made of? It's made of carbon, carbon money from the European emissions trading system. So in countries where you don't have a functioning ETS, you have a gap. So, to, so I, I, in my current role, I'm helping projects monetize um, avoided carbon in hydrogen projects um, so that they can go out in the voluntary carbon, uh, voluntary carbon markets, and narrow that uh, that uh, economic, uh, let's say, gap. Um, so that, that way, we can hopefully reach to the volumes we need to reach uh, in the hydrogen economy for key hard to abate sectors. It's a complex process, of course, uh, because you need to also be able to work across the whole um, supply chain. Um, so that's exactly what we are doing. And Cement, I've already told you um, that we are also generating uh, methodologies so we can monetize avoided carbon in the cement sector. Not avoided carbon, sorry. Uh, carbon removals in the cement sector uh, and avoided carbon in the steel sector. So briefly, um, that's
that's what I'm doing in the, in the voluntary carbon market. But we don't stop here. So currently, voluntary carbon market is what we have. But in the next year or a few years' time, we're going to also see the clean development mechanism transfer uh, into Article 6.4. Um, so we at South Pole also preparing uh, companies and ourselves so we can support projects uh, with the implementation of Article 6.4 of the Paris Agreement. So my view for decarbonization is uh, fundamentally is that by directly using green energy. Of course, carbon market is, is important, but at the end of the day, the direct use of green energy is most most important and I believe we found a solution so what's the solution think about the scaling up of uh, green in the industrial revolution for steam engines what makes steam engine scaling up it's a factory factory it's the innovation for industrial revolution factory is a place to effectively using the energy also organize the production value chain. That's a factory coming out of history. Today, we have so much way to scale up wind and the solar, but this is silo commodity to the grid. But think about it, we have so much abundant renewable energy. And the renewable energy has been lower than fossil fuel in lots of place. Why we cannot overnight to be decarbonized? Because there's a mismatch between consumption and energy productions. So that's why the net zero industrial park is next innovation to scaling up the renewable energy production and with energy consumption. So then no transportation for green hydrogens, no storage, direct usage from renewable to green products. That's a combined system, but you know, there's some challenge you should be able to harness wind, solar, storage, digital solution for forecasting weather pattern change, also to adjusting your production on the factories. So this is kind of a renewable energy system, also including the production system. So this is the next version of a factory, what we call, we call the net zero industrial park. This is going to be address direct usage of green energy. They are abundant. Is both. So not only store, you directly consume, but also when you're abundant, you can convert to some part of the, into hydrogen. If not, or be storage or direct using for green steel. So it's, it's a system. It's an energy and the industrial system. It's, it's an ecosystem. So I think that's a new form of, of factory. Thank you. Um, when we talk about solutions, we have it, it clearly there are solutions we talk we, we see that um, demonstrated here. But I think we all have to agree that it is quite risky, and it depends where you are in the world. It depends on you mentioned that the policy framework, uh, the market conditions, otherwise the resources, uh, price regimes, and so on and so forth. So all this is is quite variable across the world. So solutions won't obviously be the same. And at the same time, technology is changing, and, and through innovation, it's changing even more, which is good. But it's also risky for investors. We have to admit that. So, so the way we approach this is that that we look at different projects, different alternative solutions in different geographies. So we have uh, we're looking into projects for green iron production in northern Norway. We're also thinking about this in the Middle East. We look at green ammonia production in. Norway, but also in Chile, and we look at projects and so on. So we, 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 we and, and we see that there are similarities, but there are also differences. And this is a way of, if you like, hedging towards what would be the best solutions in the future, but also acknowledging it will be variable geometry in, so in what, what, you, what you implement. It all depends, of course, what we're talking about, but, but I think that's important to acknowledge. And, and moving forward towards net zero, it's clearly, um, myriad of solutions that we need to, to make work, but they, oh, they also have to work together. And that's, uh, that's what we're talking about when we talk about hard to bait sectors, that many of these solutions actually are interlinked and we need to make them to work together. Thank you again to all of you. We are actually at time for this panel. Thank you all so much for your insights and your, your uh, yeah, solutions in, in particular, because that is gonna form the basis for our next panel. 
um, and the d elements of collaboration that can uh, help bring those solutions forward. So thank you very much to all of our panel. And I'm sorry that our one microphone was not enabling the most <laughs> back and forth discussion there, but we uh, are making do with what we have. So I'd like to welcome our second pal panel members. And of course, anyone from our first panel who would like to, to stay up on stage is very welcome to participate in the second panel as well, if you would like. Um, but we are going to welcome, firstly, um, uh, Severine Matteo, who is just walking up to the stage now from BNP Paribas. Uh, she's the head of, uh, low carbon, of the Low Carbon Transitions Group. Um, I'm going to invite Arshad Mansour, CEO of the Energy Power and Research Institute. Um, and we are also going to uh, re-welcome back Fritjof uh, from Acker Horizons to join this panel as well. Thank you for joining us. And um, so the first, uh, first area that I would like to get straight into with you is anything that you would like to reflect on on the, on the previous panel, if there were any, if there were any uh, elements of that that stuck with you. But if not, we can move straight to the elements of collaboration where you think we see real opportunities to accelerate the transition in these hard to abate sectors by boosting and accelerating collaboration. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Samperin. Thank you. So now what is clear and we can uh, bridge the gap is um, all the previous panel as the, the, the intervention, the, all the intervention were about innovation and investment. And what we know is that without innovation and investment collectively, we won't get there in terms of decarbonization. So what is it at stake today? It's a mix. You mentioned it. You mentioned it. It's a mix. It's about more hydrogen, more batteries, uh, probably more sobriety to a certain extent, and new ways of uh, new behavior. So if we come to your question, the first one, how, what can we do to collaborate? So I'm representing the banking industries by my role. So I would say as a banker, we have to support the industry when they come for innovative projects, when they come with new ideas. Of course, we are not the one who are going to tell you what you have to do. We are the one who are going to propose you funding solutions, uh, potential partnership to be made with industrial or financing partners. And uh, what comes to funding? It comes to funding because funding is not only a matter of uh, banking or debt, it's also a matter of equity. Thus, the reference to the financing partnership. Thus, also the reference to an enhanced collaboration because sometimes the projects are not that obvious. Sometimes they came a little bit early and, uh, and it's changing, it's changing rapidly because what we see is that today um, in the context of the decarbonization, yes, we do have the renewable and the batteries. We can say that they are more or less stabilized in terms of technologies, but in terms of hydrogen, carbon capture, we are going to, fr to be uh, facing new challenges. The technologies are not uh, stabilized yet. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not even mentioning green steel because uh, it's still a, a long road before we get there, as you mentioned. And then um, enhanced collaboration, considering that the risks are increasing, the technological models are not proven yet, though, so the business models are facing more uncertainties. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass straight on to Asha Mansour. Great, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'm Arshad Mansur, President and CEO of EPRI. Uh, we are a global research, development, and deployment organization working in more than 45 countries with 450 energy companies, uh, driving innovation for a clean energy future. Um, I think the first panel was great. It provided a great insights on cement industry, steel industry, green hydrogen, and all how we can um, abate the hard to abate sectors. But I think the place where we come in, and because we work with so many organizations, we think it is essential that the net zero industrial clusters needs to be a coordinated approach between energy companies, industries, and multiple industries together. Uh, so last year at COP26, uh, World uh, Economic Forum, Accenture, and EPRI, we launched a net zero industrial cluster program. We started with four clusters, and today we have 11 clusters, US, UK, Spain, Belgium, Netherlands, China, and Australia. And all these clusters together is almost 350 
million tons of CO2, which is more than UK or which is more than Italy. And they represent almost 1.25 million jobs and approximately $225 billion contribution to GDP. So what are we trying to do with this cluster? Then we hope to get to 100 clusters by 2030. Because if you look at industrial emission, which is almost 30% of global emission, it primarily comes from clusters, which is geologic, co-located energy companies and co-located chemical and other industries. So getting all the industries together on a cluster by cluster basis, sharing the best practices of not just what technology would be needed, but what is the common framework for sharing, let's say a CO2 pipeline. Because now you're sharing pipeline with steel industry and a chemical industry and a cement industry that may be all you know, co-located. So I think we expect over the next decades, years, that these clusters, which initially has to be funded with some government funding. So we have $8 billion from hydrogen hubs that's working in the US. So I think the net zero industrial cluster, the work we are doing with Accenture, World Economic Forum, and the fact that we already have 11 clusters, and some of the clusters just a hydrogen, the Houston cluster represents the largest use and production of hydrogen today in the world. Now it's produced not in a clean way, but that's a great opportunity to work with industries on a cluster basis. And we expect to see real progress being made this decade as we go forward. Yes, um, this, uh, the comments from my previous, uh, pan uh, the, the previous two speakers are, I think, are, are spot on. Uh, we really need to collaborate and we need to seek new models for collaboration because, as, as we alluded to several times now, the linkage between energy and industry sector is, is very clear. We need to, it's easy to say, but we really have to get models that where we, where we get a good collaboration there. But also, as, as you say, the collaboration between different industrial sectors. So this cluster idea is very important. I would also add that in many cases, we also talk about off-takes. We need to have customers for the products, a little bit of depending on what we're talking about, but that also needs to be into that collaboration scheme of things. So I think that's, that's very important. When it comes to government, clearly the infrastructure uh, investments and things like that has to be uh, also very needs to be coordinated uh, and then you often have an, int an international aspect of that once you have things crossing borders and so on so you, ha you have also that aspect when it comes to governmental collaboration and since you represent also research and science I think that's extremely important to build that into the model as well because it, so you can get some also coordination when it comes to the innovation that needs to take place within these clusters. Thank you, Fritjo. Much, uh, much uh, like the, the structure of the other panel, I'd also like to um, probe a bit more deeply with you. What, what are the, the barriers to the bits of the collaboration that you've identified? So in the, on the investment side, is it that we you know, need greater incentives? Do we need uh, specific financing tools? Um, on the RD&D side, I mean, are we, are we getting the kind of the push policies from governments to, to bring these technologies through the early stages when they need direct support? Um, are there any kind of um, important uh, barriers to collaboration on that front? And then if I can tie this in with the, the next question as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you, you can point to any good examples in your sectors other, uh, and in your areas of support, can you point to, I mean, you have in, uh, in the industrial uh, clusters uh, example there, um, Asha Mansour already, um, but if we can point to any good examples of overcoming these challenges in the, in the areas of collaboration. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think that more than cooperation, we need alignment. We need alignment on where we have to go. We need alignment between the industry, in the banking, well, the in financial institutions, and the government or the, let's call them, the regulatory bodies. For me, this is today the first, we, this we have to crack this step. We have to go to the next level, and to do so, we would need more. So industry, banking, financial institution, they have started to work together. Today, uh, that's a very European point of view uh, because in Europe we had regulation to support the renewable industry development and so on. But what we see is that 
if you look at hydrogen, if you consider all the infrastructure we would have to develop to make it work, um, if, you look, if you consider that we also have to incentivize the end consumer to change their habits, then yes, we would need more regulation that could take the form of regulated asset base as we had in infrastructure, because we are dealing with infrastructure, but also incentive, um, fiscal incentives, call it this way, tax rebate, and um, it works for Europe, but if you look at what the US just did with the IRA, uh, it's, it's great. I mean, uh, and even from a European point of view, we have clients, European clients, telling us that no, indeed, they are going to try to invest in the US because the, the, the fiscal regime is super positive. So maybe we have, a, this is showing us the way, and uh, maybe this is part one of the challenge uh, we have to take into account alignment, which goes with more maybe incentive, incentives and so on. No, just a quick, I think um, we already talked about the challenges. The first challenge is we really don't have a legal framework on how co-shared facilities could locate in an industrial cluster. So I think experiences from all these clusters on how competing industries and energy companies can come up with a common framework to supply and demand of, uh, I think, clean energy, I think that would be a great opportunity to overcome that barrier. I think the initial seed investment, I think it, it's not going to come just from the private sector. But we already are seeing, you mentioned the IRA Act, but we are seeing billions of dollars in the European Union. That is also leading to, you need a catalyst and investment that is backed by government. You know, we have a loan guarantee program in the U.S that we also back that. I think that's another barrier that we are seeing that we are overcoming. The third is not a barrier, it's an opportunity. An opportunity for us to think broadly on what the solutions, tools in the toolbox are. So we heard about biological intervention to create concrete. We hear a lot about wind and solar and hydrogen. What we also need to think about is the growing interest in nuclear. And it's worldwide, not just in the US and not just large 1,000 megawatt plants, but small modular reactors. Dow Chemicals in the US, they announced that some of the molten salt reactors produces the steam. It's a stream producer, hydrogen producer, electricity producer in a very flexible way. So I think as technologists, as collaborators, we need to keep an open eye on what solutions are there. If you have significant amount of wind and solar penetration, which we will, because the costs are coming down, but you also have significant amount of nuclear, which is mostly base load, the current version, then you could also use excess nuclear to create clean fuels when wind and solar is flowing. So I think it's an integrated approach. I think we are, we are very excited that the industrial clusters will give us examples after examples after examples. And just one cluster, I'll say, it's the largest industrial cluster in the UK, Humber. It's in the up near Nottingham and Leeds. And um, they are working with UK government. They are part of our cluster. And they have an opportunity to reduce almost 12.5 million tons of CO2 by 2030. And if you look at 12.5 million tons, in a global scale, it's not much. But it's taking 2.5 million cars off road in terms of emission reduction. And they're looking into an approach where CCS, hydrogen, and renewables all are tied together. So we are excited about the Humber cluster, but we are excited about all the other clusters, and almost every month we have a new cluster that is joining, and we're looking forward to be the hub to share the information among all the clusters. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to, to, uh, to sort of ask a question back to, to the panelists here, because we, we I think, uh, create, having, generating clusters, getting collaboration, is, is great, we all agree on that. But how do we avoid that we don't get very diff big differences in the approaches you have, for example, between the EU and the US, given how different the situation might end up being? Uh, EU is struggling with very high energy prices. Hard to bait industries typically need energy, obviously, that, that, uh, that suffers them. So the US has already an advantage there. On top of that, you have the, you need support schemes or uh, subsidies or green premiums for the products you're producing in, mo in general for hard to bait sectors. 
uh, and which is at right now because of the Inflation Reduction Act also much more favorable in the US. So how do we, as an, as, as an industry, how do we work that, given that we, we certainly want to move this up on a global scale and we want to have these clusters not to be sort of a class A and a class B, depending on which region you are. Clearly the answer to this is you know, policies and nobody here from the governments, but, but I think that could be a problem, at least in the shorter run, that you have sort of a differentiated approach to the, to the clusters. Uh, I didn't moderate the I'm not sure, uh, um, we won't do the same. We won't do the same the same way. Uh, indeed, uh, the way of financing the renewable industry in the, in the US is, the dif is different from the one we have in Europe, but it works. It works. So each market would have its pro and cons. Uh, and we've if we come back to hydrogen, for instance, and for the new technologies, my view, my personal view is that this is, we are going to be much more global than before. If you look at hydrogen, what do we need to produce hydrogen? We need a lot of renewable, wind, solar, a lot of space, then uh, everything to crack the H2, H2O molecule, and then we need to transport, and then we need to send it to the end user uh, location. So the issue is that you are producing hydrogen uh, on the remote areas, whilst in Europe uh, we need them. So hydrogen will be produced in Argentina, Chile, Australia, uh, to a certain extent in, in the US, but for the local market. So my view is that the market is going to be global. Uh, each regional market would keep its specificities and it will work because it has always been working this way and there is no reason to change. Nevertheless, we can work on, speci on some specific market. Hydrogen at some point, the, the key one to unlock, and this is maybe the catalyst, is also a um, work on some form of a global carbon market because this would be the last incentive. If there is no price attached to do your carbon emission, what do we do? How are you incentivized to change? No, I, I, I think you, you answered it right. Um, we are a global organization. We work in 45 countries. So for us, optionality is the king. And we really feel optionality provides you with two things. Optionality provides you with affordability in places where nuclear may be more affordable, places where wind and solar may be more affordable, places where CCS is possible, but optionality also provides you with resiliency. Because when you have optionality, we look into US last year, um, year the January Texas freeze. Um, it was good to know that many of the homes had gas heating because that gas heating provided them with another option. Now. The future of gas will be a gas that's a mixture of gas, renewable gas, and hydrogen. And that's the transition that we will go through a long term. But as we are going through the transition, I think the key thing is if we lose sight of optionalities and just focus on green or pink or gray or yellow or pick your color, then we will not be able to achieve a net zero future. Thank you very much, both of you. I have one question that now is very selfishly asked because I work for an intergovernmental organization. I work for the IEA. I, I would like to pretend I'm the, the cashier at the checkout of the, of the shop that you're in and you have one policy ask from the policymakers uh, sitting behind uh, this uh, imaginary cashier desk. What is your, what is your one, uh, one policy that you would ask for or one government intervention that you would, uh, you would say is most important? I think we heard global carbon markets there from, uh, from Fatima, that, like whether, whether that's uh, possible to ask for one government or from a, a set of regional governments, anything on that front that you think would be um, uh, your, your number one ask. I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought as we uh, <laughs> shout above the noise, but I think you, uh, think you get the idea of my question. Okay. Um. I don't have one policy ask, I have multiple. So maybe um, one could summarize uh, the whole, maybe we should just ask them to accelerate on the permitting across all sectors. That would be a good start because uh, beyond that, uh, it's not totally uh, rational. They have not started to look at it. So permitting. Well, as, as a nonprofit independent organization, we don't have any policy take. If I had to uh, crystal ball and look at one thing, and it's happening, is invest in innovation, double down on innovation, supersize innovation, 
And while you're doing that, make sure that the results are shared. So innovation that will be funded by IRA funds, innovation that will be funded by Horizon 2020, and innovation that will be funded by other government agencies, we need to create a global framework on how we are learning things and not just duplicating what each other is doing. I'm lucky to go last because, in fact, I get three now because I can just say that I agree with the, with the two previous ones. If I may add one, it would be um, that policymakers in a specific region or country think about their policies in an integrated fashion because typically you will have support schemes addressing different parts of this picture. But as we in the industry and the energy and the industry, we need to coordinate. We also need to coordinate policies because we often see that poli well, some policies are directed towards innovation, some are directed towards industry, some are directed towards energy supply. And by coordinating them better, you can have stronger impact. I think the Inflation Reduction Act is a good example because it's really sort of put together in a more coherent fashion. So um, that would be my additional. Thank you very much, Fritjof, for that last intervention. Thank you very much, Fatima. Thank you very much, Arshad. It's been a real pleasure to have this panel with you. And uh, as a mark of empathy for those who need a few minutes to go to their next pavilion and don't know where it is, uh, we're going to finish a few minutes uh, just before four. Thank you very much. <laughs>